Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vernon Poole, as Tina mentioned. Um, I want to talk about the NIS directive, what it means to you, because there's been quite a few changes, quite a lot of developments. So I'm keen to update everybody in terms of A, what it means, and B, how Sapphire are working with clients to actually achieve compliance to the requirements. Just a bit about myself. I'm a recognised trainer in both information and cyber security governance, member of the UK and international 27,000 group. And importantly for this presentation, I'm a NISC, uh, an, an NCSC guidance practitioner. So I work very closely with the NCSC, especially their NIS directive team. I'm also a CCP, a CSG certified practitioner and aware of the, of the requirements as it affects public organisations and as it shows their head of business consultancy at Sapphire. So what I want to cover, and to assume no noise from anybody on the call, I want to go through these um, five key areas. First of all, a bit of background to the directive. Secondly, the implementation timetable and, in, and its implications. Thirdly, the applicability to operators of essential services and digital service providers. Fourthly, going through the guiding principles and the cyber assessment framework. And finally, how Sapphire can help you to meet the compliance requirements. So if we look at the background, it was initially adopted within the EU in July 2016 with an implementation of the 9th of May 2018. And I think it was somewhat overshadowed by GDPR that came in on the 25th of May. Well, this is the first European cyber directive that's looking at each nation state to put in a national framework, not only for the strategy, but for an incident response team, a single point of contact, I'm working with their competent authorities, which I'll explain in a few minutes. One of the key aims across Europe is the cooperation group, so people can expect, share experiences in terms of the cyber threats and risks that they're facing on a pan-European basis. And importantly, and I think this is a very significant area, it's a framework that's applied across all the sectors affected looking at what we call appropriate and proportionate security measures. Appropriate based on the risk you're facing and proportionate to the size of the organisation. From a UK perspective, the head of NCSC, Kieran Martin, has been very bold by saying that we are very close to facing a catastrophic cyber attack, what he calls category C1, anything up to C4 we deal with, but the C1s will be dealt with primarily by the NCSC. It's pointed out that Russia are now carrying out a series of intrusions for espionage and a possible pre-positioning. And importantly, from the NCSC's perspective, they're spending a lot of time now on what they call offensive cyber so that they're actually proactively looking at actually halting the activities of nation states and major cyber groups. You can see in the last bullet point there that the NCSC have been working to combat over a thousand significant cyber attacks, some that required pan-government response across a number of departments. So this is real, it's here, and it's affecting many organisations. In terms of their offensive security, they've set up this active cyber defense program. Any of you go to the cyber, to the NCSC cyber links, you'll see they do weekly threat analysis of cyber threats. They also send out a range of cyber um, advisories. And this is just an example of some of the statistics to, sh to show the activities they're doing to combat and bring down sites that are causing calm to UK PLC. So in terms of the implementation timetable, 
this just goes through some of the key points, some of the key headlines, and importantly, it shows where we are currently. So the high-level information security principles were issued in mid-2017 as a public consultation document. And early, early last year, the cyber assessment framework was issued. We're now on to version 1.1. And this lays out indicators of good practice for operators of essential services and digital service providers to adhere to to ensure that they're in line with the assessment framework. At the same time, their competent authorities were issuing specific guidance to those people in those sectors so that when it came to this, the, the legislation going live, everybody was aware of what was required of them. It was only late last year that the competent authorities produced this detailed security guidance, and it was only in March this year that the competent authorities received training on the directive and its adherence for people in those sectors. So the timetable has been delayed slightly, just so that the competent authorities are aware of A, what was going to be set for their sector, and importantly themselves receiving in training how the early years with the NCSC. What is important in the last sentence there is that operators responsible for managing their risks implementing defined security measures in a proactive way to ensure adequate mitigation of these risks. In terms of its penalties, it very much follows the same principles of GDPR, but in terms of the fines, there has been a maximum fine implemented of £17 million. That's to cover all contraventions contraventions, whether that's a failure to cooperate with a competent authority or to re fail to report a reportable incident or follow to fail follow their instructions. This is an area that the competent authorities are very keen to carry out and it will be the competent authorities who will actually issue the penalties. Important to note there'll be no double jeopardy you couldn't get fined under both GDPR and the NIS directive. There will be a discussion that takes place as to what fine will be issued and when. It's important also to point out, as shown in italics, these penalties will be only issued as a last resort. The main aim is for organisations to establish proportionate and um, appropriate security measures and demonstrate they've got robust processes in place. In terms of the incident reporting, you can see there the incident response is very pivotal to the NCSC and the notification to competent authorities within the 72 hour reporting window is just the same. Looking at what's got on under GDPR, you can see in the last paragraph there, the ICO have reported a 400% increase in cyber incidents being disclosed to it following the implementation. So I think this is encouraged to show that organisations are going to be more open and transparent and liaising with the ICO. And I think we're hoping this will follow with the competent authorities in relation to NISD. So I said earlier, the NCSC are responsible for category one incidents. They're looking at protecting UK PLC. The competent authorities are the ones who are going to be working with the operators of essential services and digital service providers. They're providing all the ongoing guidance, support, and it's them you report incidents to. And if at the last resort a penalty has to be issued, it will come from your competent authority. So who's impacted? ANISA, the European Security Agency, published this quite neat diagram that actually shows who are in scope and who's not in scope. You can see in blue there, it talks about the operators of essential services from digital infrastructure, energy, healthcare, drinking water, transport, banking and financial markets, and also the online digital providers. So the online 
marketplace. So there you've got clothing retailers like ASOS who need to report to the ICO. So it's a lot wider than people realize. If we look at it now in terms of those sectors, the energy sector is typically electricity, gas, national grid, oil refining, oil pipelines, storage and transmission. So a very broad sector in the energy markets. On the transport, it's all types of transport, air, road, rail, ports, canals, freight, transport. So again, a very wide definition who, who's under scope. Interestingly, in terms of the financial services sector, the submissions made by the FC, FCA means that they've already got adequate arrangements in place. And you can see there in bold, it shows that they're exempt of the NIS directive because they've already got good arrangements in place already. But you can see healthcare providers and suppliers of water intended for human consumption. And then the last two is digital infrastructure and digital service providers. So what I want to do is give two examples and I know there are a number of NHS uh, delegates on this webinar. The NHS have decided to integrate the directives requirements into their security guidance. So if you look at it as it's shown with the two bullet points, the new DSP toolkit, the data security and protection toolkit, the 2019-20, which was updated very recently on the 25th of June, lays out the requirements for how you deal with NISD as it affects NHS trusts and foundation trusts as advised by the NCSC. In Scotland, it's slightly different. They've got an information security policy framework, version one that was issued on the 13th of March this year. And for each of those areas, the competent authorities are the Department for Health and Social Care. And there's some guidance there if you want to go to it. So you can go to NIS authority at dhsc.gov.uk. And in Scotland, it's the Scottish Health Competent Authority. Interestingly enough, both the, both the guidance documents actually explain how to deal with NISD following the ISO 27001 format of controls. And all they've done is added in the requirements for GDPR and the NIS guidance. So you can see here across a whole range of assurance framework. In orange, you can see where NISD is. So it follows very neatly the ISO 27001 route. It also gives guidance there in relation to Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, and for those organizations impacted by PC DSS and GDPR, how it all sits there. And the aim primarily is to put to the culture in place, and you can see the culture line there, is to make sure that everybody in the organizations are aware of what these requirements are and how they need to work to comply to these requirements. If you look at the energy sector, these are responsible for not only adherence from their perspective, but as it shows on the first bullet point there, have a responsibility to drive compliance into their supply chain. So it's going to become a third uh, a regulatory obligation and any operator of essential services and digital service providers will issue that guidance within their third party questionnaires. So it's not just the narrow definitions of operative essential services and digital service providers, it will apply to everybody in their trading circle. And that's important to be aware of because you might not be directly involved, but you might have to adhere to, the, to them if you actually work with those impacted by it. And you can see there you've got the gas uh, off gem are taking an increasing role of working with the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And when you look at it and you look at the actual threats that they're actually facing, this slide shows you all the cyber issues that are facing all 
operated essential services. So you've got the threats there from ransomware, plant and equipment damage, data manipulation, and total shutdown. The challenge is how to work with a, an increasingly technological sophistication of operation and the loss of experienced workforce if there's actually um, a reduction in manpower. And then the solutions. And this is important that first we're looking to embrace it from the top, from a governance perspective. The aim to educate the workforce, dealing with new emerging technologies like artificial intelligence. And importantly, there, not only the third party, but the supply chain collaboration. So energy replies, relies on the, the power grid. So there's a lot of independencies in the actual energy sector. So what are the high level principles that you'll find within the CAF, the cyber assessment framework? It covers four key areas or objectives. The first one being managing security risk and the appropriate organizational arrangements around it. Secondly, how you protect against a cyber attack and the range of proportionate security measures you need to put in place. The third one is detecting cyber events, cyber security events, and this is a critical area. Have you got the tools, technologies, and capabilities of identifying these cyber security events? And fourthly, how we minimize the impact of cyber security incidents. And this all comes down to your response capabilities to identify pinpoint and actually sit on the incident before it gets into the public arena and inform the competent authority or if the NCSC get involved for a major category incident. So if we dig down and look at it in a few more details, looking at the, the appropriate organizational structures, you can see it covers four key areas. The overall governance in terms of leadership from the top, effective risk management and linked to that effective asset management are you aware of all your vulnerability points because if you look at it from the energy sector they've got a lot of not only it facilities but ot facilities operational technologies in terms of control systems and finally the supply chain as i mentioned earlier your dependencies to ensure that you're as strong as your weakest link The second principle talks about proportionate security measures in terms of your policies and procedures, identity and access control, how you control data in terms of unauthorized access, in terms of access provisioning, overall system security in terms of what aspects you take in there. A lot of that is covered within Cyber Essentials, especially Cyber Essentials Plus and how resilient your networks and systems are in terms of the checks and balances you've established. And finally, and importantly, staff awareness and training to make sure that they're given the adequate support required when dealing with a cyber event. The third area, and the one that I think will cause a lot of problems for many organizations, is to what extent you've got the capabilities and the tools to both effectively deal and identify with security events. What security monitoring tools have you got? What's the depth? What's the analysis? What proactive monitoring are you taking place? And how do you deal with anomaly detection? So this is going to cause a lot of issues because we're looking at it from a technology business processes for all the operators of essential services. And the final one being your incident capabilities in terms of response and recovery and the improvements you're going to put in place to minimize the opportunity for that incident to reoccur. So when you look at the actual cyber essential framework, it covers these three main areas. First of all, when you look at those guiding principles, a lot of the requirements can be addressed under ISO 27001 and the 14 guiding principles. From a technical perspective, 
all the requirements that the NCSC put in place in terms of Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, or the groundwork, the baseline that organisations need to put in place. And as I mentioned earlier, there is specific NCSC guidance. They put out their 10 cyber security steps to be followed, and they're constantly revising their guidance. So it's important to look at what guidance they're putting out on an ongoing basis to deal with emerging threats and the actual steps needed to actually protect yourselves. So where are we? As I said, it's a European standard. Some countries like the Netherlands adopted this directive as a law in January the 1st, of, uh, January the 1st in 2018. And it's calling for many critical operators to work not only across sectors, but across boundary legislation so that we're looking at the emergence of circular dependencies. As I mentioned earlier, energy rely on telecom infrastructure and digital service who in themselves rely on the power grid. So there is a great interdependency in terms of the operative essential services, and it's important that cross collaboration is very important. In terms of where we are across Europe, only 11 nations currently have complied. The EU sent a directive out this time last year to the other 17 member states. And if you want to know where each country is, there's a link there that shows you where you can go and see who's up to date, who's actually fully compliant and what steps organisations need to take. In terms of pitfalls, I think this is important and I think this is what the competent authorities are working with their sectors. There are some sectors that have low cyber security maturity. If you think of inland transport and some of the ports, they're not as advanced like I would say um, you've got finance that have been shown that aren't going to be applicable. So you've got a variety of organisations ranging from low cyber security maturity up to high level maturity. So I think it's important to be aware of where you stand, that level of proportionality, to make sure that the, the key aim is to learn from other organisations in terms of information sharing. So the, the key thing is from the cyber, cyber assessment framework, how best you currently comply. So have you carried out an initial self-assessment so that you know what your security posture are? Are you strong in the governance side? Is it areas in risk management or are some of the checks and balances and tools you're deploying adequate to give you the level of resilience that's required, not only for yourselves, but from the competent authorities' perspective? So you can see from bullet point three, the key is to ensure that you've got a regime that's fit for purpose in relation to your environment and your risk appetite. What we're doing, working with a number of clients at the moment, is focusing on three key areas. First of all, defend. Ensure that you can and have got the capabilities again to, to defend against evolving threats. Secondly, deter. Have you got proactive measures in place, as was seen by the NCSC's position on offensive action? And thirdly, develop, investing in your capabilities from a people and a process side to make sure that you've got a competent workforce in place. So our aim working with clients is looking at it from a visibility, gaining an understanding of the risks and the challenges, helping organisations to build robust controls in place, and then focusing, directing the resources and budget to areas of greatest need in relation to the CAF. I hope you found it a useful webinar. I'm now open for questions and thank you very much for listening.